Charles, thank you very much. And, and Wendy, thank you very much indeed for inviting me to um, speak this evening. When I started work a long time ago, Wendy and I worked in the same office, and I greatly appreciate it. So many years later, you should ask me to um, do this. Um, Tacitus isn't nearly as much in fashion as his predecessor, Livy, or Livius, as we should call him. It's rather remarkable, by the way, that we call Livius Livy, and we don't call Tacitus Tassi. I shall carry on calling Tacitus um, Tacitus. Uh, Livy is in fashion because he wrote about the Roman Republic, and the Roman Republic is increasingly seen to be one of the great inspirations of the Italian city-states, and the writings during that period um, were a great inspiration to the founding fathers of the United States. And this recovery of the past, and in particular Machiavelli's discourse um, on the Roman, on Livy's discourse on the Roman, Roman Republic, um, ripples through the academic world, the fringes of which I now um, inhabit. Tacitus wrote about empire. Um, and if, he, if there's one single thing he said about empire, it is that an emperor should be prudent. And this is going to run through part of what I will say about the geopolitics of the international monetary and financial system. Um, he also pointed out that peace depends upon armies and that armies require paying and that paying requires uh, taxation. What I think he didn't go on to say is that once you have a tax base, you have the basis for state money. And if your state money is used beyond your borders, then your hard power is supplemented by soft power, or more importantly, by symbolic power. And I will come back to that right at the end when I contrast part of what I say with a recent lecture that Ben Bernanke gave um, in Washington. Um, Tacitus, as I bet you've been told every year at this lecture, was um, interested in Britain too. He was partly interested in Britain um, because his father-in-law um, helped reconsolidate Roman power after the unrest led by um, Boudicca. It's funny that we call her Boudicca now rather than Boadicea, which I think we called her in my um, youth. He, he, and Tacitus, as well as remark, remarking upon the gender equality that our ancestors um, subscribed to in regal succession, he describes our island as rainy, cloudy, occupied pe from people across the continent, which is quite interesting, faction-ridden, and strongly superstitious. And that brings to an end um, what I will have to say about the United Kingdom um, this evening. I, I, I will say a absolutely nothing that is either explicitly or implicitly about the United Kingdom or any of its parts or about its... Um, future, because what I want to offer some reflections on are, as I say, the geopolitics of the international monetary and financial system over the next quarter or half century. And the tectonic plates are going to shift around the big blocks of power, the America, perhaps Europe, which I'll come back to, China, India, Indonesia, Brazil, um, who knows who else. So fast forward a little bit under... 2,000 years to 1971, and Treasury Secretary, U.S. Treasury Secretary, um, John Connolly, at a meeting, I think, in Europe, says to his peers, mainly European peers, but I think the Japanese may have been there as well, the, the dollar is our currency, but your problem. And it's worth remembering who John Connolly um, was. He had been governor of Texas, he was a Democrat serving as Treasury Secretary for Republican President Richard Nixon. He was in the car, I believe, when President Kennedy was assassinated. He was very badly injured himself um, and survived. Um, he was a hard-edged, tough politician. Um, by his own declaration or admission, uh, he wasn't an an economist. Um, as I say, he was a tactician and a, stra um, a strategist, and that showed. So about a decade 
little bit less than a decade before 1971, something rather remarkable had happened in the international monetary system. Um, a few years after Suez, when the great separation of UK and, I've mentioned the UK, the UK and French foreign policy, and a few years before de Gaulle pulled France out of NATO, he did something which people remember less well, but was dramatic in the monetary sphere, was that he took his dollars to the United States and said, honor your obligation to give us gold um, for those dollars, and which the United States duly did, and the gold was brought, I think by French warships, to Europe. And this was both a signal that the French were dissatisfied with the extent and manner of US leadership, and it was also a signal, um, a more subtle one in a way, that they didn't believe that the United States had either the fiscal discipline or will comfortably to support the international endeavors that they were then um, embarking on in Southeast um, Asia. Now you might think, so why is Connolly saying um, it's our currency, but it's your problem? because the others could have exchanged um, their, their dollars for gold. But they didn't. And before he made the statement, the US had suspended gold convertibility. They'd done something else too. They had introduced import tariffs and various other things. So the Germans and the Brits and the Japanese and all the people that held the dollars that had financed the UK the US um, current account deficits, they were in a little bit um, of a hole. The US wanted to devalue. Um, they didn't want the US to devalue, but they even more wanted the US to lift its um, import tariffs. And so the US floated. And this was um, the demise of the Bretton Woods system, and it was an exercise of raw power by the United States, and it was a demonstration of quite skillful um, tactics by Connolly and his team, um, which included Paul Volcker, um, later the great Federal Reserve um, chairman, but at the time um, one of the um, officials in the US, US Treasury. Now the striking thing about this period was that even though everyone was really pretty angry with each other, um, the dollar survives um, as the world's dominant reserve currency and nothing else is ever going to happen. And the reason nothing else is going to happen isn't just because America was the biggest and most successful economy in the world, it was because this is almost the height of the Cold War. And West Germany in particular, but the rest of us in this part of the world, we are utterly dependent upon American um, defense. And added to that, as I've said, no one else remotely has the strength to substitute themselves um, for the dollar. So that sounds great from an American point of view, um, except that it's not really that great um, and ended up being quite a difficult decade. Because as the dollar fell, so the income of the oil exporters in the Middle East, um, who invoiced then as they do now in dollars, their incomes collapsed. So they were a little bit fed up. Well, they were initially squeezed, and then they were a bit fed up. And following the Yom Kippur War, they decided to introduce an oil embargo um, and to push up the price of oil. And the effect of that um, in this part of the world, but most dramatically in America, was to push inflation up um, very sharply. And so America now had stagflation, rising inflation, and falling economy, rising unemployment, alongside the fallout of Watergate and the domestic tensions of its withdrawal from Southeast Asia and the end of the Vietnam War. And that continued um, until the Volcker Fed in the early 80s generated a backbreaking recession uh, in the United States to restore the internal value of the dollar and therefore 
underpin um, the role of the dollar as the financial part of US hegemonic um, leadership. Now, the point of that story is just the interweaving of geopolitics, domestic politics, technical monetary stuff, and I could probably talk for longer than, I, than I'm allotted just talking about the, the technical monetary stuff during that period, which was remarkable in itself. And it's worth saying here that the person who led um, the Committee of 20, who tried to design um, the new regime, Sir Jeremy Morse, passed away um, recently. He was a great figure in the city of London, but actually a greatly valued um, figure around the world. I happened to have been with Paul Volcker um, the day after it was announced that Jeremy had passed away, and I could see um, how sad Volcker was, a man in his late 80s himself, to, to hear this. And there was no new system, um, but what there was emerged out of this um, weird combination of regional politics and geopolitics and economics. And what I want to suggest and what I want to explore is that maybe something like that lies ahead over the next 25 years or 50 years. Um, it might be this generation of policymakers, it might be the next one, but it's hard to believe that it's not coming. And, and this is rare. The, the economic policy community and the foreign policy community generally live in different spheres, trained in different disciplines, with different think tanks, with a largely segmented commentariat, not entirely, um, in different buildings, which in some capitals they don't visit um, very much, with different priorities, different values, different mental um, frameworks. And my suggestion in a way is that there are moments when they need to come together again and now or now-ish is one of those um, moments. What I'm going to do is offer a few thoughts about what the deep basis of the current international monetary and financial system is, then go through three components of that system and the geopolitical um, entanglements and currents that run through them, and then offer four scenarios of how the world may end up, two of which look tolerable and two of which look pretty bad. And anybody in the room could think of their own scenarios. There's nothing special about the scenarios that I identify. Now, where does it come from? The current order is still um, more than an echo of the Bretton Woods Conference in New Hampshire, the White Mountains, which if people haven't visited them, are truly beautiful. It was a good place for them to go in 1944, secluded away from the war, secluded from policymakers. Scores and scores um, of officials um, there from all over the world. The last time I was there, I stayed in the room that had been occupied by the, the Russians. And of course, the great stars of this conference were Keynes, um, brilliant, um, quixotic, um, with a very sharp tongue, and a very clear vision of how the world ought to be um, designed. A pretty inspiring vision in many ways. And the American there, Harry Dexter White, who perhaps isn't well, as well known in this country as he should be, um, a strategic genius, um, a master business manager who really outfoxed Keynes at more or less every, at every stage, um, helped of course by the power um, behind him. And he, he's a figure of fascination in part because it turned out that part-time he was a Soviet spy. Um, which is quite interesting when you think they're designing the world. And so when people debate this great conference, when they get beyond the two great personalities there, they tend to debate fixed exchange rates versus floating exchange rates and gold and silver and symmetric versus asymmetric adjustment and all of that. And what they forget is a moment of absolutely crunching geopolitics, which is that Secretary of State Hull um, is absolutely clear that there will be no conference unless the United Kingdom um, 
disbands imperial preference because the president um, hasn't taken the United States into the second war in, a few, in our continent in a few decades, only for our empire and the French empire and other empires to be left intact. The precondition for the technical discussions is a geopolitical um, moment. And what comes out of it, um, the settlement that I think we have lived with over the past 70 years, I think, I think has two big, um, broad ingredients. The first is the dollar succeeds sterling as the de facto reserve currency, sorry, the de jure world currency, as well as the, as well as already being really, the de facto world currency. Um, we give up our empire, but we do something more important as well. We and our continental colleagues, we outsource defense. Um, through NATO, but it absolutely is clear that since that moment, um, currency leadership means in our con continent, defense leadership. Um, and if you live in or around Berlin, this is something you remember to this day. The, and that I would say um, has worked pretty well. The other part of it is that there is a shift from the, through the 1930s, but particularly from the late 1940s and especially from the very late 1940s when the UK um, imposes exchange controls for oil to be invoiced in dollars rather than in sterling. And the flip side to that is that the Western powers and particularly um, Washington acquiesce in the accommodation between the Middle Eastern ruling families and their religious um, establishment, which has ended up being quite a complicated accommodation, both for their world um, and for um, our world. Now this, this is a world, the world that we have all grown up in, is a world where all of that is absolutely taken for granted. Where the United States issues the currency in which everything is traded, it's the numeraire and the medium of exchange, um, as economists would say. And this was just in the 1960s, I think by Giscard d'Estaing, who was de Gaulle's, then de Gaulle's um, finance minister. This was um, described as carrying with it an exorbitant um, privilege. That because they felt, the French felt, that what we in Europe and the rising economic powers, then Japan, in Asia were doing is that we were subsidizing um, American consumption and we were subsidizing the financing costs of American businesses that could expand um, across the planet. And you might think of, and there's some truth in, in that, the French are extremely thoughtful about the international um, monetary system. And, but maybe it goes alongside the, if you like, the bargain, the great bargain about defense, where we have been able to enjoy more leisure um, than we would be able to enjoy if we bore the whole burden of our defense ourselves. But it also overlooks the curse of being the world's um, reserve currency, um, which for economists typically goes by the name of the Triffin Dilemma. Um, Robert Triffin was a Belgian-American economist, Belgian-born and largely trained, and then moved to the United States, and he pointed out that particularly under a system of fixed exchange rates, which the world then have, if you are the world's um, reserve currency issuer, you need to make sure the world has plenty of that currency, which means that you um, enforceably run large current account deficits, and those current account deficits can eventually be your downfall. And even though the logic of, of that isn't quite as, as binding in a world of floating exchange rates, Nevertheless, the temptations remain because financing yourself in dollars is systematically um, cheaper. Now you might think, well, so just on economic grounds, why would any new power um, entertain being a reserve currency issuer? And I think there are two reasons that dominate that whole um, discussion. The, the first is, it's incredibly useful in a crisis 
practically a homegrown crisis. Being the reserve currency issuer is essentially a self-insurance policy. So if you go back to 2007 and 2008, and particularly to the dark days of 2008 when the US subprime crisis is bringing the ceiling down, and it is the American ceiling that is being brought down um, at that point. Our ceiling too, but our ceiling's a bit smaller. Um, what happens to US Treasury securities? They rally. The financing costs of the US government go down in, during the biggest homegrown financial crisis they have had in 70 or 80 years. Just at the point at which um, the US government steps in um, with fiscal support for the American people, which it did for a while, um, they are better um, able to afford doing so. This is a marvelous benefit to have. And I think actually, in my view, it overshadows the kind of running benefits um, that de Gaulle and Giscard d'Estaing um, were focused on. And it would be very surprising, um, indeed it would beg a belief, if the extremely smart people sitting in the capitals of the growing powers of the world hadn't studied and absorbed this um, with great care, as well as the symbolic power that goes with being the world's um, reserve currency issuer. So that's the backdrop. I now want to describe where I think we are at the moment before moving on to my um, four scenarios. And I'm talking, remember, about the, the intertwining of the worlds of foreign policy and economic policy. And at this point, a foreign policy um, expert will probably talk about the South China Sea, um, the Shia Sunni um, tensions, Russian geopolitical strategy, and possibly um, the fate of Latin American presidential um, democracy. Um, and in many respects, I really wish I could talk about that now. Um, but I claim no expertise to anything. Um, but I have somewhat better credentials for talking about the far less gripping um, elements of the international monetary and financial um, system. So that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to talk about th three components um, of it. So the first one I'm going to talk about is the world of net capital flows and current account imbalances. You can think of that as the world of macroeconomic policy. And I would um, describe that as a world of impotent politics. The second is a world of gross capital um, flows, um, whether it's debt or equity, whether it's um, buying whole companies or buying portfolio equities, whether it's short-term, long-term, foreign currency, domestic company. That's the macro financial world, and I would describe that as a world of angry um, politics. And the third component is the, is the extraordinary interconnections between financial institutions, banks and dealers and insurance companies, and so on. That's the world of regulation, and I would call it a world of opaque um, politics. So, and I will, I will try to go over these fairly um, swiftly. So the first one is the macroeconomic world. We have lived, and still to some extent, live in a world of what economists call macroeconomic imbalances, and what they mean by that is that part of the world has been running um, persistent and therefore cumulative surpluses. Um, China, in our continent, um, Germany, and other countries, notably the United States, but also um, others, including the UK, have been running persistent and cumulative current account um, deficits. And at the level of the world, the, or, the current orthodox view, which I broadly share, is that there has been an excess of world savings over world investment. And that this has been driven, not exclusively, but largely, and I'm talking about the years running up to the crisis, by 
the dynamics of China, where even though the pace of, an ex of expansion of their business investment is truly mind-boggling, um, it has lagged behind the growth in their savings, with the consequence that, um, or the counterpart, that China um, has run an enormous savings surplus. And other, other countries have done that as well. And the impact for us in the West was that this pushed down the world real interest rate because something has to equilibrate investment and saving. Um, for those of you that aren't economists, trust me, this has to add up at a world level. Um, to, to the last cent, by the way, it has to add up. Um, and so this pushed down the world real interest rate and that pushed up asset prices, um, including equities and houses. And that, of course, provided the collateral for the credit splurge that in particular the United States embarked on in the years running up to the um, crisis. And people agonized about this a lot before the crisis. This wasn't something that people only stumbled across in 2008, 2009. There was endless discussion of the global imbalances, as they were called. And many economists um, and many of my former colleagues in the official sector around the world would say, China, um, it's in China's interests to shift the balance of its, of its growth. Um, Mercantilism, as most people call it, I call it mercantilism, um, it doesn't work. Everyone knows that it doesn't work. The books, the history books, not just the economic books, are full of accounts and demonstrations of why it doesn't work. And I, I was in many such discussions, and I would always say the same thing, much to the boredom and possibly eventually the irritation of, of colleagues around the world, which was, well, the thing about mercantilism, it works for the mercantilists. And if you don't believe me, if you travel around the English countryside, you will come across houses and you will visit some of the houses, uh, although you will not be allowed into some of the other houses which are lived in and enjoyed by the descendants of the mercantilists. Because, my God, it worked very well um, for them. And mercantilism is essentially a, an alliance of political interests and um, business interests that gets entrenched in government and makes reform tremendously hard. And this is what policymakers found. They found that it was hard to shift anybody away from that path. The second thing, um, the second element of the, of the current system is the world of gross um, capital flows. And the best way to think about this is over the past few years, as American monetary policy loosened and then tightened, and not only American monetary policy. This happened in Europe from the Swiss and the ECB into Eastern Europe. What happens is as you ease monetary policy, capital flees to earn a higher rate of return, particularly short-term capital flees to earn a, sh short, a high rate, higher rate of return um, in other countries, particularly in emerging market um, countries. And when the tide turns, as it did recently, um, then the money all flees out, or flies out. And this has caused great angst in the emerging market world. And some Americans have responded to it by saying, you complained about, you were complaining about all the money rushing in and our easing interest rates. Now you're complaining about um, all the money rushing out when we tighten um, interest rates. And of course, that misses the point. They complained about the money rushing in, partly because they knew the day would come when the money rushed out. And this manifests itself in two ways in the current policy debate around the world. The first is represented by Raghu Rajan, the governor of the Central Bank of India and a Chicago um, economist and incredibly well known in the United States and policy circles. And he has repeatedly said, and, and said very articulately, that America needs to um, give greater weight to the rest of the world and that it needs to do so for two completely different reasons. One is it is in America's self-interest um, to do this, given that these economies elsewhere in the world are big and therefore if they get into trouble, that can now have a meaningful impact on the United States. But secondly, that it is America's moral duty to take it into account 
um, as part of its responsibilities as the global reserve currency issuer. The other response, spearheaded by Olivier Blanchard, who until recently was the chief economist at the IMF, is, well, actually, maybe countries should introduce controls on short-term capital flows, which, of course, at least in my mind, um, runs the danger of us slipping into the protectionism that the G20 leaders protected us from and held hands and protected us from in the back end of 2008 and 2009, which is one of the things I think they will go down in history for. And the third component is the component of regulation. And unlike macroeconomic policy, however conceived, where you basically have all the information you need um, in order to make policy. You make policy mistakes because the world is uncertain, but you're not short of information. This is a world that is completely different. This is a world where you don't know the status of your banks and your dealers, um, except in partnership um, with other authorities abroad. And it's a world where you might want to tighten your capital requirements because you are concerned about another part of the world. So imagine if America had tightened their, um, or made American banks hold more capital against exposures to Europe in the run-up to the crisis. Would that have brought forward um, the euro area crisis? Or imagine if we in Europe had made our banks and dealers hold more capital against the US subprime um, bubble. Would this have been seen as an act of aggression? Would it have brought forward um, the US crisis? This is a world, um, the world we're heading into is a world not just of information exchange, which is relatively, relatively easy. In fact, still quite hard. Um, but a world of cooperation and coordination. And no machinery um, exists to do that. So with that as background, let me quickly um, outline four scenarios. The, f the first scenario is one where American financial and economic leadership is sustained and the dollar remains the world um, reserve currency. Um, that's one where America is going to have to be skillful um, and diplomatic. It's going to have to remain the engine of innovation and technical improvement. Um, it's going to have to avoid um, creating a global crisis um, again. And it is going to, ha increasingly as the decades pass, it is going to have to avoid um, inadvertent um, offense. And people on the other side are going to have to forgive inadvertent um, offense occasionally. The, s the second world is a world where there are rival um, reserve currencies, one issued in Washington and one issued in another part of the world. Th th this is a, a world where um, there's competition um, in every sphere, from the South China Sea through Africa and Latin America, through the capital markets and banking markets to currency markets. It's a world that loses the advantage, the public good, of a single numeraire and medium of exchange. It is a world where the next tier um, of powers play the two great powers off against each other in every sphere. It's a world where the big central banks may end up giving swap lines to other countries as a move in the 21st century's great game rather than um, on entirely prudential um, considerations. The third um, scenario and it's the one that comes close to our continent, is where the top table um, has numerous people at it. It has the United States, it has China, perhaps it has India, perhaps it has Brazil, perhaps it has Europe. And Chancellor Merkel is, I would say, very focused on that world. I was lucky enough to be at the enormous celebrations for when uh, Mario Draghi succeeded Jean-Claude Trichet at head of the ECB, and it was a day of quite remarkable speeches. Helmut Schmidt gave one of the greatest speeches I've ever heard, and I feel lucky to have been alive to hear him, frankly. But Merkel said, if, made a few remarks that really struck people in the audience, whether they agreed with them or not. She made four points. As I recall, and I haven't checked my notes, and I haven't checked 
um, check the text. But as they struck me and others at the time, she made four points. The first was, it is wonderful to be alive um, at a point in history when these emerging markets are booming and lifting hundreds of millions, if not billions of people out of poverty and where the world becomes a richer, more varied, uh, more interesting um, place. Her second point is, this is a world where the top table might be as I described, a, a world um, of many powers. And as part of her second point, the conclusion of her second point is, Europe should want to be at that top table. And she made a point about the value of European civilization. The third point was a kind of digression into Germany's remarkable achievements as an economy. And she talked about the reforms um, introduced by the other side of German politics and how those had enabled Germany to carry on being so dynamic. And her third point was, um, however successful Germany is, it cannot be at the top table of the world that she was describing. Only Europe could be at the top table. And that's a world um, where the monetary union has to be reformed and deepened and where the structure of the rural economy needs to be almost revolutionized to make it more dynamic um, and, and innovative. And it's a world where you could expect there needing to be more fiscal discipline as well because it's a world in which maybe the United States would say to us, you need to carry more of the cost of your own defense because we are now stretched prospectively across the whole planet. And it's a world where the heads of the big international institutions either rotate amongst the members of that top table or rotate amongst the Mazaplan layer of countries who are not at the top table. That's not a terrible world either. The worst world is a world of protectionism and autarky where we shrink back to, um, to a world that existed for a while in the middle of the 20th century before the war. It is a world of, of protectionism and where all the benefits of comparative advantage and of exchange and of trade are thrown away. And my point, in a way, is that it will take wisdom to avoid being in worlds one or three rather than worlds two or four. And that, th that wisdom won't come entirely from monetary institutions um, or finance ministries in the narrow sense. Now, let me conclude by contrasting this with an extract I have to say, ripped partly out of context from a really terrific lecture that Ben Bernanke gave in Washington um, last autumn. So this is what Ben said. Overall, the dollar standard appears to provide a global public good, and the rents to the United States of providing that public good seem to be much diminished, at least relative to the Bretton Woods era, with the benefits to the users and the provider of the dollar standard less asymmetric than they once were, we shouldn't be overly exercised over controversies about whether the dollar will retain its preeminence, the future of the renminbi as a reserve currency, and so on. These debates are more about symbolism than substance. In purely economic terms, the universal usage of English, say, is far more valuable to the United States than the broad use of the dollar. And that's not the note I'm striking at all. Um, the use of English is a great use to us as well in England. But we don't control English, and any English English speaker knows that. Many Englishes are spoken around the world, and that's marvelous, um, as long as the languages and literature of other countries and languages is sustained. But we don't control English. It is quite unlike the dollar. The United States controls the dollar, just as during our period of hegemony, hegemony we control sterling. Nor is this just about symbolism. It is to do with the true value of the self-insurance during economic crises that being the reserve currency 
um, provides with. But above all, symbolism isn't a small thing. If we've learned anything through the anthropologists and sociologists of the 20th century, it is that symbolism is a massive form of soft power. Um, and it's soft power in the glow of which we in this continent have been able to bask over the past 50 or 60 years. Now, as I said, my message in a way is very mundane and it is very simple, which is that the tribe I am part of, the economic policy tribe and the foreign policy tribe, really don't need to take very much notice of each other for much of the time. But I doubt whether that will remain true over the coming decades. At the very least, they're going to have to read each other's parts of the newspaper. At least I hope so. Thank you.